Here are two more examples of trig substitutions. These examples are definite integrals. Definite integrals make the first step more difficult since I have to calculate bounds, but they make the later steps easier since I don't have to reverse the substitution. In this example, I've left a and b as unknown constants instead of as specific numbers to give a bit more general of the result. This is a sign substitution. a squared minus x squared under the square root is the pattern that matches with the trig identity for sine. The substitution is x equals a sine theta, with dx equals a cos theta d theta. The square root term transforms by replacing x squared with a squared sine theta, then pulling out the a, then using the trig identity to replace 1 minus sine squared with cos squared, and it simplifies down to a cos theta. What is new here are the bounds. With trig substitutions, often I will have to solve for theta in the bounds. When x is 0, this means 0 equals a sine theta. So theta is the arc sine of 0, which is also 0. The restricted intervals for the substitutions, which I mentioned in the second video, are important here. They match up with the domain and range of the inverse trig functions. So arc sine works well here. Likewise, when x is a, the substitution equation becomes a equals a sine theta. So theta is arc sine a over a, which is arc sine 1, which is pi over 2. And now I have all the pieces, the substitution, how the dx changes, the square root term, and the two bounds. Here is the replacement, 0 to 0, a to pi over 2, the square root term to a cos theta, and the dx to a cos theta d theta. I pull out the constants and write the two cosines as cos squared, and then again I use half angle identity to replace the cos squared with 1 plus cos 2 theta over 2. I split up the integral into two doable integrals, find those antiderivatives, and then evaluate on the bounds. The result is pi a b. I don't have to do the difficult step of reversing the trig substitution at the end, since I can just evaluate on the new bounds. Here is one last example, and this is a lengthy one. It's a good one to recap all of the techniques and strategies of trig substitution. The square root term is 9x squared minus 1. This looks like a secant substitution, but I need to change this so it has the form of x squared minus a squared. I do this by factoring 9 out of the term under the square root which leaves the 1 as 1 ninth, and then pulling that out of the square root as 3. Well, then I have x squared minus a squared with a equals 1 third. Then I use the secant substitution, which is dx equals 1 third secant theta tan theta d theta. The term in the square root becomes 1 third tan theta, using the secant and tangent trig identity to replace secant squared theta minus 1 with tan squared theta. Then I also need the bounds. Here again, I have to do some solving to figure out how the bounds change. When x equals root 2 over 2, since x is equal to 1 third secant theta, this means that secant theta must be root 2. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine, so cosine theta must be 1 over root 2. Using a unit circle diagram, this means that theta must be pi over 4. Similarly, when x is 2 thirds, Secant theta is 3 times this, so secant theta is 2. Then the reciprocal cosine theta is 1 half, which means that theta is pi over 3. These are all the pieces of the substitution, and now I can go ahead and make all the replacements. Here are those replacements. The bounds are changed to pi over 4 and pi over 3. The dx becomes 1 third secant theta tan theta d theta. The x to the 5 becomes secant to the 5 theta over 3 to the 5 and the square root term becomes tan theta. Then I have to simplify this. I have a bunch of threes in various numerators and denominators. By simplifying the nested fractions, I'm left with three to the six in the numerator and three squared in the denominator, which works out to 81, and I pull that out. The one secant in the numerator cancels to leave secant to the four in the denominator, and the tangents cancel out and the secant in the denominator can be written as a cosine in the numerator, so it all boils down to this trig integral. This is an even power, so I use the half angles again and write this as cos squared squared, which becomes 1 plus cos 2 theta over 2, all squared. I expand the squared term into three pieces, and then split the integral up using linearity, which gives three integrals. The first two are doable, integral of a constant and integral of cosine. I can go to the antiderivatives and evaluate these on the bounds. 
The last is still a cosine squared, so I'm going to need to use another half angle. Here is that second half angle. The cos squared of 2 theta becomes 1 minus cos 4 theta over 2. Then again, I can split this up into 2. All through this, I'm being quite careful with the various constants that are produced. I know I have an 8 in the denominator under these two last terms, and I can't forget that it's there. Finally, though, I can finish the last two integrals by determining the antiderivative and evaluating it on the bounds. This term with the difference of pi over 3 minus pi over 4 becomes pi over 96, which I'll move earlier in the addition to combine with the other multiple of pi. Sine of 4 times pi over 3 is 1 over root 3, and sine of 4 times pi over 4 is 0. And lastly, I can do all the arithmetic with all these terms, go to a common denominator of 64 to get this final expression. I don't normally give an approximation, but if you wanted one, this number is slightly larger than 3. This finishes the long and complicated integration by trig substitution. There are lots of details, lots of moving parts, lots of algebra and arithmetic, but still it is a pretty effective algorithm for a very important and otherwise very difficult class of integrals.